This morning we've gathered together to celebrate a very unusual event. We've gathered together to celebrate a resurrection. Now, a resurrection involves much more than just a dead person coming back to life. If someone merely comes back to life after dying, that is a resuscitation, not a resurrection. In a resuscitation, an individual comes back to life, but they come back to the same body, and ultimately they die again. The biblical story of Lazarus is a good example. Jesus commands Lazarus, who's been dead for four days, to come out of the tomb. Lazarus came back to life. He came out of the tomb, but he was in the same body with the same limitations all human bodies have. And after a few years, he died again. C.S. Lewis said he felt sorry for Lazarus than any man who had ever lived because he was called back from the gates of heaven to to come back to this earth, to live on this earth with all of its pain and difficulties, only to have to go through the pain of dying all over again. This morning we come to celebrate something far greater and more amazing than any resuscitation. We come to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave. We come to celebrate an event so unusual that it's only happened once in the history of the universe. We gather together to mark the occurrence of something so dramatic that all of human history is split by it into B.C. and A.D. When we say that today is April the 9th, 2023, what are we 2,023 years from? What's the reference point? What event was so earth-shattering that it's our reference point for all dates and times, even for your birthday? Well, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This this morning, we come to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave. We come to declare that he's conquered death, never to die again. We've come to proclaim that he came back to life in a new resurrected body that looked somewhat like his former body. People could recognize him, but he could walk through walls. He was impervious to aging, disease, pain, or death. We come to affirm the teachings that Jesus proclaimed that they're true because they were validated by his amazing resurrection. We come to celebrate his promise that because he lives, we shall live also. We come to humbly acknowledge that Jesus Christ now sits at the right hand of God the Father. We come to assert that someday, just as he promised, he will visibly and physically return to the earth and ultimately destroy evil and rule and reign forever. But all those affirmations rest on the foundation of the resurrection. The resurrection is the most important doctrine of the Christian faith. As Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 7, if Christ has not been raised, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Paul goes on to assert what he'd witnessed personally when he met the risen Christ on the road to Damascus. Paul writes, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. The resurrection is real. The question this morning, though, is the resurrection a reality for you? The Bible says it's true. Church history says it's true. Two and a half billion Christians that will celebrate Easter this weekend say it's true. But the most important question this morning for you is, do you believe it's true? In John 11, 25 and 26, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? He asked Lazarus' sister, Martha. Well, do you? You know, one of the unique aspects of Christianity, when you compare it to any of the other world's religions or religious movements, is that it traces its origin back to one particular event on one particular day in history. Now, that's not true of Buddhism. It's not true of Judaism. It's not true of Islam. It's not true of atheism. One day, there was no such thing as a Christian church, and then suddenly, overnight, there was a group of people who believed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and were willing to suffer all kinds of persecution, even being tortured to death, rather than to admit that the resurrection wasn't true. Why? Well, because in the early years of the church, many believers had personally seen the risen Christ. At one time, more than 500 saw him in one place at one time. But even after the eyewitnesses died, people continued to be willing to die for their faith because they'd experienced the living Christ who had changed their lives. There were more martyrs for Jesus Christ in the 20th century than all the previous centuries combined. Why were so many people willing to die for their faith? 
because they'd experienced the living Jesus Christ working in their lives. There are four biographies of Jesus in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In all four, the last week in Jesus' life is given the most attention. Now, that's unprecedented in any biography. Why would they all be written that way? Well, it's because the early followers insisted with remarkable unity that the one event that created the Christian church was the fact that Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead. Now, in our day, many people think the resurrection would be good news, but if they're honest, they're not sure it's true news. The thinking, even in many liberal Christian churches, goes like this. In ancient days, people didn't have much scientific understanding or knowledge, so they were a bit gullible. So when Jesus died, some people felt a vague sense of his presence still inspiring them. Over time, this vague sense of his presence morphed into legends that he had been raised from the dead. Now, the only problem with that theory is that legends take, take decades to develop. It's a historical fact that suddenly in 33 AD, there was a group of people who were proclaiming Jesus had been resurrected after he was crucified and that he was alive and working in and through the lives of his followers. And despite all kinds of lies and withering persecution, within weeks of the resurrection, there were more than 5,000 believers in Jerusalem where he'd been crucified. And in less than 300 years, it was the official religion of the Roman Empire that for the previous 300 years had done everything in its power to destroy Christianity. Now, how could that happen? Well, the simplest answer is Jesus really was who he said he was, and he really did rise from the dead. People in the ancient world weren't stupid. They knew that dead people stayed dead. That's why the resurrection of Jesus Christ had such an impact. There's a story about a woman who looked out her kitchen window one day, and she saw her German shepherd, and it had the neighbor's pet rabbit in its mouth, and it was shaking it to death. Now, this woman's family didn't get along very well with the neighbors, so she knew this is going to be a real disaster. So she grabbed the broom, ran out into the backyard, pummeled the dog with the broom, yelling at him to drop it until he finally dropped the rabbit. She picked the rabbit up. She saw that the rabbit was completely dead. In a panic, she rushed into the house. She shampoos the rabbit. She blow dries it. She combs it to fluff it up till it looks like a rabbit again. Then she sneaks into her uh, neighbor's backyard. She puts it in the cage and she hopes that they'll discover it sometime later that day that the rabbit, you know, oh, look, our poor rabbit has died. About an hour later, she hears screaming coming from next door. Our rabbit, our rabbit, her neighbor cried. He died two weeks ago. We buried him out in the field, and now he's back. <laughs> it was only then that the woman realized her German shepherd must have dug up the dead rabbit. People in the ancient world knew dead rabbits stayed dead, and so do dead people. Jesus was dead when they took him down from the cross. The Romans who crucified him knew he was dead. They weren't fools. The hundreds of people that witnessed Jesus on the cross knew he was dead. And even if Jesus' disciples had stolen Jesus' half-dead body from the tomb, as some skeptics today claim, and the guards at the tomb were paid to say by the Jewish religious leaders, not even with all the miracle drugs we have today can you take a man who's had the 39 Roman lashes with a whip with pieces of metal and glass platted into it that rip open the flesh and cause profuse bleeding, a man paraded through the streets of Jerusalem until he collapses under the weight of the cross and blood loss, a man who'd been nailed to a cross and lost more blood, hung in the sweltering Middle Eastern sun for hours, then been wrapped totally head to toe in suffocating grave claws without food or water or medical attention for three days. We couldn't even make someone like that today with all of the medications and knowledge we have. We couldn't making appear literally in a time that could be counted as ours to appear to his followers convincingly as the risen and victorious Lord of the universe. Jesus' followers were witnesses to his death. They knew he was dead and that he should have stayed dead, but he didn't, and that changed everything. 
New Testament scholar N.T. Wright notes, there were many messianic movements in the first century. In every case, the would-be Messiah got crucified by Rome as Jesus did. In not one single case do we have the slightest mention of the disappointed followers claiming that their hero had been raised from the dead. They knew better. And why did they know better? Well, because for Jews, resurrection wasn't supposed to be a private solo event. There were a lot of different beliefs about what happened to you after you died in the ancient world. Epicurus was one of the great Greek philosophers. He believed that when you died, that was it. You were gone. That's why he said, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. He said, you don't have to be afraid of death, though, because there's no sensation. You die. You just go to sleep. You don't know anything. You cease to exist. Of course, the vast majority of people in the ancient world and throughout history simply have not believed that. They believe there's a life after death, but it's some sort of shadowy underworld that wasn't that pleasant and, and was to be dreaded. The Jews, however, had a completely different belief about the afterlife, one that was around long before Jesus. They believed in the resurrection. In the book of Job, which is probably the oldest book in the Bible, he writes in Job 19, 25, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I will see God. Only men of, men, men, one of many indications that the Jews from early in, in their belief in God believed that there would be a resurrection. The Old Testament taught and faithful Jews had long believed that the problem isn't just that we all die, but that the world is a mess filled with pain and suffering. The crux of the problem is humans can't fix the mess. But the Jews believed there was a great God who created all things, who one day would bring the righteous back to life and heal all of creation. They believed that resurrection is not just about afterlife, but about a God-perfected, God-redeemed, God-set-right life. They believed that God would step in, forgiving the sins of His people, establish justice, end suffering, heal creation, and resurrect His people to enjoy this new creation. They believed that when that happened, it would be dramatic. It would be obvious. It would be undeniable. And it would be done in mass for all of God's faithful children. And this is very important. They believed it would all happen at the end of history, at the end of time. They believed they, and we who are living now, live in an evil, fallen time because of our rebellion against God. But when the resurrection occurs will be ushered into a wonderful new God-created perfect age. Now, while just about everyone else in the ancient world believed that life was an endless cycle, Israel introduced the, the idea that history was headed somewhere, one far-off divine event toward which all creation moves, as it says high in the capital of the dome uh, of the U.S. Capitol. What does that have to do with Jesus' resurrection? Well, no one in Israel would have ever thought to claim that one individual had been resurrected in the middle of history. If someone claimed that, the immediate response would have been, has disease been eradicated? Has justice broken out? Has all suffering come to an end? Stop talking nonsense. Saying that someone had been resurrected in the middle of history would be like me saying to you today, well, last year in 2022, just the Astros' first baseman won the World Series. The rest of the team will have to wait until a later time. That doesn't make any sense. Just as winning the World Series is a team deal, the Jews believe that resurrection was a team deal. God raised all his children back to life at, at one time, at the end of time, the end of history. But Jesus breaks the rules, just as he'd done so many times before in his life in ministry. Jesus wasn't a rabbi like other rabbis. No, no one ever taught with his authority. He said, I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He healed the sick. He cast out demons. He raised dead people back to life. Those who knew him knew that he was a one of a kind, completely unique, and they believed him that he was the long-awaited Messiah and that he was the one who would overthrow Rome and usher in God's kingdom and rule from Jerusalem the entire world. But none of them saw the twist that was coming. Jesus would soon die to pay for the sins of all of those who would follow him so they could have a place in God's new creation for all of eternity. 
When Jesus died, even though he'd predicted it, none of his followers said everything is going according to plan. Everything is fine. None of his followers thought his death was a good thing. Jesus' followers believed they were finished in the wake of Jesus' execution. The picture we get in all four Gospels is that his followers were disheartened. They were dismayed. They were disappointed. They were disillusioned. They were dispirited. But then suddenly they weren't. What changed everything? Two things. First, witnesses saw that the tomb was empty. And second, Jesus appeared to his followers. It was a combination of those two factors that was overwhelming. One without the other wouldn't have done it. If it was just an empty tomb, but Jesus didn't appear to anybody, skeptics would say, well, this is just simply a case of grave robbery. But Jesus did appear. The Apostle Paul wrote within two decades of Jesus' death that the risen Christ had appeared to Peter and all of his other disciples who'd ministered alongside him for three years, and then to more than 500 others in one place at one time, and then he'd appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus. On the other hand, if people had reported that they had seen Jesus, but the tomb still had Jesus' body in it, skeptics would claim those people are just having visions or suffering from delusions and hallucinations. If the Roman and the Jewish religious leaders could have produced the body, they would have. The graves of heroes, especially crucified messiahs, were commonly venerated as shrines by their followers. The problem with Jesus was the tomb was empty. This is simply not a story that someone could make up because it violated their understanding of what was going to happen in history. There's another reason we can know the resurrection really happened. Mark says that the empty tomb was first discovered by Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome. Now notice what all three of those people have in common. They're all women. Today that wouldn't be a big deal, but in ancient Israel, women were so low in status that they were not regarded as credible witnesses. In fact, they weren't even allowed to give testimony in Jewish or Roman courts. If you committed a terrible crime and the only witness to that crime was a woman, you probably would go scot-free. How extraordinary then that Mark points out that the first eyewitnesses to the empty tomb were women. In fact, in all four Gospels, they all point out that women were the first witnesses. If you were going to make up a story of Jesus being raised from the dead, there's no uh, advantage to having women serve as the eyewitnesses. It would have seriously undermined the credibility of your claim. The only plausible explanation for why all four Gospels say the first witnesses uh, of the empty tomb were women is it was women who found the empty tomb. And the tomb was, in fact, empty. The Grand Canyon wasn't formed by a few Indians digging with sticks, and despite continued opposition and persecution, the 2.2 billion member Christian church today and all that Christ's followers have done to change all of history would never have happened unless Jesus Christ had really been raised from the dead. When Jesus stepped out of that tomb on that first Easter Sunday morning, that was the most important event in human history. Why? What does Jesus' resurrection mean? Well, it means three things. It means Jesus is is who he claimed to be. It means Jesus has the power he claimed to have. And it means Jesus does what he promises he will do. And all of those have tremendous implications for our lives. First, the resurrection means Jesus is who he claimed to be. In John 11, 25, Jesus proclaims, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. Jesus made some outrageous claims while he was here on earth. He said things like, I'm God, I and the Father and one, I'm perfect, I'm the only way to heaven, I'm the Savior of the world. A lot of people want to make Jesus just a good moral teacher, but a good moral teacher would never say things like that. I can teach you and you can say, well, you know, Alan is a, is a good moral teacher. But if I started calling myself God, you wouldn't say that anymore. You'd say, Alan is a lunatic. Alan's lost his mind. Jesus was either who he said he was or he was the biggest liar who ever lived. One day Jesus cleared the money changers out of the temple. They said, well, what right do you have to do this? He he basically says to them, because I'm God. And they said to him, well, prove it. And he says, I will. Three days after you kill me, I'm going to come back to life. 
to tear this temple down, in three days I'm going to raise it up. He was talking about his body. He claimed to be God, and his resurrection backs up what he claimed. God came to this earth in the form of a man so we could know what God is like. His name was Jesus Christ. He died on a cross to pay for our sins. He split all of history into A.D. and B.C. by his resurrection. Jesus is who he claimed to be. That's the first thing the resurrection tells us. The second thing Jesus' resurrection means is Jesus has the power he claimed to have. Jesus says in Matthew 28, 19, All power in heaven and on earth is given to me. Because he has all power, he can take care of you in every situation. Because he's God, he can do everything God can do. In John 10, 18, Jesus says, Nobody takes my life from me. I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it up again. It wasn't nails that kept Jesus Christ on the, on the cross. It was his love for you. There was no force that could keep Jesus in the tomb because he loved you. He wanted you to know. Not only that he was alive and the ruling uh, Lord and Savior of the universe, but that you could trust him with all the promises that he made to you. The Romans killed him. They, he was put in a tomb. They put a big stone in front of it. They sealed it with a Roman seal. They posted a 24-hour guard, a guard, but they couldn't prevent the inevitable. Jesus says, they can't stop me. I gave my life away and I can take it up again. Maybe that's where we get the phrase, you can't keep a good man down. Jesus' resurrection proves that Jesus is who he claimed to be, that he, that he has the power he claimed to have. And third, the resurrection means Jesus did what he promises he would do. In Mark 10, 34, Jesus said, They will mock and flog and kill me, but after three days I will come back to life. The cross was no surprise to Jesus. It was all a part of God's plan. When you think about it, there's, a, there's humor in the, in the Easter story. I mean, how would you feel if you'd been the guys who put Jesus to death, you publicly execute this man in front of hundreds of witnesses who see him die, then, you, then, then he's buried, a heavy stone closes his tomb, they seal it with the Roman seal, a 24-hour guard was placed there at the grave to keep anyone from tampering with it, but three days later, this guy's appearing to people around Jerusalem, walking around the city. I'm back. Now, that's a little scary. But the angel said, don't be frightened. I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified, but he isn't here. He came back to life again, just as he said he would. Jesus did what he promised he would do. When God makes a promise, you can count on it. That's what Easter means. Because Jesus did rise. He is who he said he was. He has the power he said he has, and he keeps the promises he makes. What difference does that make in our lives? Well, I could go on and on for the differences that it makes. Because Jesus is who he claimed to be and has the power he claimed to have and does what he promises to do, our past can be forgiven. You know, I don't know, whether, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I'm working on a project about halfway through it, I wish I could just start all over again. You learn as you go along, don't you? And a lot of us probably at one time or another in our life have thought, you know, I wish I knew what I knew now and could start all over again. Well, in Colossians 2.14, it says he has forgiven all of our sins, canceled every debt we owe. Christ has done away with it by nailing it to the cross. How long do you remember a bill that's been paid? I never think about it. Once it's paid, I forget it. The point is, once God has forgiven it, I can forget it. Jesus paid for all your sins and mistakes on the cross. Romans 8, 1 declares, there is now no, no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. That's the Etch-a-Sketch verse of the Bible. You all remember what an Etch-a-Sketch is. You draw with the little knobs, and then you turn it over, and you shake it, and you turn it back over, and you get a completely fresh start. Well, you know, Jesus doesn't automatically undo all the consequences of the mistakes that we've made in the past, but he does make all things new. He takes even those mistakes, even the worst things that we've done, and he, brings, he can bring good out of it and healing in our own life and, and help for other people if we just turn it over to him. You really can have a fresh start, and you can know that's true because Jesus was resurrected from the dead to give you that fresh start. Second, the resurrection matters to you and me now because it shows our pre present problems could be managed. 
You know, much of our lives are unmanageable for us. We don't have control over the political turmoil in our nation. We don't have control over the high crime rate or inflation or the turmoil, you know, in, in the world. We don't have control over whether there's war or peace, what diseases we might get or pandemics we might face. Maturity is when you figure out that you don't control most of the things that are most important in your life. But God can, and He will. He says if we come to Him, that He'll be the Good Shepherd, the Good Shepherd of the 23rd Psalm, who leads us beside the still waters, who restores our soul, who walks with us even through the valley of the shadow of death. Ephesians 1, 19 through 20 says, How incredibly great is His power to help those who believe in Him, the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead. The same power that enabled Jesus to rise from the dead can help you rise above your problems. Philippians 4.13, Paul says, I'm ready for anything through the strength of Christ who lives in me. He says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. No problem is too big for God. No situation is hopeless if you turn it over to Him. The resurrection matters because it means my past can be forgiven, my present can be managed, and the resurrection matters because it means my future is secure. I know that when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. And you say, well, how can you know that? How do you know if the good you did in your life outweighs the bad you did in your life? Well, because that's not the way it works. The way the Bible says it works is, is that because Jesus died on the cross, it's not a matter of who I am and what I've done, but who he is and what he did for me on the cross. That, that our salvation, you know, God had, there, 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 there are two ways to go to heaven. Plan A and plan B. Plan A is, is that you would be perfect. All you've got to do is follow all the laws of the Bible, never make any mistakes, and then you're ready for heaven. You're perfect. But I tell you what, I, and I bet you too, have left perfection uh, behind long, long, long ago. None of us is going to make it in on plan A. And God knew that, so there was plan B, and that's that he would send his son. And he would die on the cross for your sins. He'd come into this world. He'd show us what God is like. He'd teach us the things of God. And then he dies on the cross to pay for your sins and my sins. And we get in on his ticket. That's the message of the Bible. 1 Peter 1.13 says, We have been born again into a life full of hope through Christ rising from the dead. Hope means you don't have to fear death. You also don't have to fear life. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. The story of Easter is a story not for just when you die. It's a story for right now. It's a story about how God wants to know you now and walk with you now and take, take your, lift your burdens now. And though we may not always understand what's happening around us or why things happen the way that they do, you can understand that God loves you. And His promise is He's ultimately working all things together for your good, that He'll never leave you, that He'll never forsake you. And that when your life here on earth is over, that you'll go to be with him forever. The story of the resurrection is not just good news, it's great news, and it's true news, and it's relevant news you can use. And when Jesus says, whoever lives and believes in me will never die, that's not a metaphor. That's not a, a vague hope. It means death has no power to take you from the arms of your loving Heavenly Father. As a matter of fact, the Bible says nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. That means whatever the bad news you face is, if you've trusted in Christ, you have a resurrection coming. For elderly people who feel like no one will, uh, for elderly people whose health is failing and almost gone, you don't have to live in fear because you have a resurrection coming. For lonely people who feel no one will ever really love me, God has provided a family for you and your brothers and sisters in Christ here on earth and a family forever for you in heaven. So you don't have to feel alone. You have a resurrection coming for the person who's worried and afraid about the world situation and what will happen, happen to them. God offers you his care right now and forever. And you don't have to live your life in fear and worry and anxiety because you have a resurrection coming. Easter says, don't give up, look up. Take the hand of Jesus Christ and it's because, he, because he's risen, because he's the resurrected Lord, the king of life, the king of all that there is beyond this life. You don't have to be afraid because you have a resurrection coming. This morning I would just urge you, 
If you want to find his pardon, his purpose, his peace, his power, crown him as King of kings and Lord of lords in your life, what better time than on Easter Sunday to make that commitment in your heart between you and God? I want to accept what you did for me on the cross. I believe your words. I want to walk with you day by day. And I'm not afraid because I know I've got a resurrection coming. Would you join me as we pray? Father, we thank you. We thank you, Father, that you did not leave us to face this life alone, that you never intended for us to live this life by ourselves, that you always intended to be our good shepherd who would love us and care for us and see us through all the difficulties, even in this fallen world in rebellion against you. And after, Father, you've walked with us through this life, Father, that you would take us to be with you eternally. Father, help us to live not for the dot but for the line. We focus on the 70, 80, 90 years that we're here upon this planet, and we put all our energy into that. But, Father, you keep reminding us in your word that this life passes by so quickly. It's decisive because we've got decisions that affect all of eternity. But, Father, it passes by so quickly. Help us to live, not for the dot, but for the line, for the uncountable trillions and trillions of years of eternity. Help us to know, Father, that though we don't understand what happens, that we should never doubt your love for us or your goodness. We can't see how all the pieces go together, Father, but you promise that you can take even the worst things other people have done to us, the terrible things that we've done in our lives, the mistakes that we've made. Father, you can take even the darkest threads and weave them together and in your plan and in your purpose over the span of eternity that you will make all things new and all things right. We thank you that we can know that all these things are true and all your many promises are true through your son, Jesus Christ, who you raised from the dead. Father, we rejoice, we celebrate, and we pray that you would help us to live in the light of the resurrection. For we pray these things in his name. Amen.